Grace and peace, my brothers and sisters, which are considered the saints in the eyes of the Lord. My name is Brother Yehuda, and today's topic is justification and its effect, results of justification. Now today we're going to learn about how to be patient, what what patient, what the good that 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 is done in being patient in tribulations and trial. So we should not have to worry about when we go into our trial and tribulations to be in, be patient and take the affliction with patience because we know that we have hope so we can take it with gladness. This is what the, the Heavenly Father through Christ is trying to teach us so we can understand how to walk in the faith and the hope. Now we're going to be in the book of Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 5. And I will read. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulations worketh patience. And patience experience and experience hope. And hope make it not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now here Paul is explaining to us that if we walk in patience in our tribulations and we work it works patience because we we understand the hope that make us not ashamed of the tribulation because we know we have hope. In the love of God through Christ So it gives us the courage To walk in that tribulation And fear not And not worry Now the precious benefit and privileges Which flows from the justification Are such as Should it quicken us all To give diligence To make it sure to ourselves That we are justified And then to take the comfort And renders to us And to do the duty it calls for from us. Now the fruits of this tree of life are exceedingly precious. We have peace with God. And that's what we want. We want to have peace with God. We don't want to deal with the wrath. We want to have peace and live eternally in our inheritance. By being obedient and walking in the love. Now we're going to go in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 1. And it reads, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why that's part of the obedience. People want to leave Christ out if they, they can just come to the, the, the throne of glory without without mentioning Christ. You have, he's the mediator. He gave up his life so we can have life. So we must recognize Christ as our Savior, as our Messiah, as our King of Kings, as our Lord of Lords, as our Messiah. As the anointed one This is how we have to reference our, our diligence to Christ Because he deserves every glory That's given to him Because he died for our sins Now we're going to go in the book of Romans Chapter chapter 5 verse 1 Therefore being justified by faith We have peace with God Through our Lord Jesus Christ That's in the book of Romans Chapter 5 Verse 1 So it's being spoken It's being told to us That we are justified By faith We have peace with God Through our Lord Jesus Christ So through Jesus Christ We are not justified by faith Because we can't be justified by faith in man We have to be justified by faith Through our Lord Jesus Christ That's in the book of Romans Chapter 5 verse 1 It is sin that breathes and crawls between us and God. So the sin is what keeps us in the quarrel with God and man. It creates not only a strangeness, but an empathy. The holy, righteous God cannot in honor be at peace with a sinner. While he continues under the guilt of sin... Justification takes away the guilt And so the justification Is you're justified by faith 
that takes away the guilt and you're justified by faith by believing in Christ because Christ is the faith and so makes way of peace and such are the kindness and good will of God that immediately upon removing of that obstacle the peace is made by faith we lay hold of God's arm and his strength and so are at peace we're going to go in the book of Isaiah, chapter 27, verse 4 and 5. Fury is not in me. Who would set the, the breeders and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn them together. I'll, or let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me. And he shall make peace with me. That's in the book of Isaiah, chapter 27, verse 4 and 5. There is more in this peace than barely a sensation of enmity. There is friendship and loving kindness, for God is either the worst enemy or the best friend. Abraham, being justified by faith, was called the friend of God. We're going to go in the book of James chapter 2 verse 23 and the scriptures was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was and put it unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God that's in the book of James chapter 2 verse 23 which was his honor but not his peculiar honor Christ has called his disciples friends now we're going to go in the book of John chapter 15 verse 13 through 15 greater love has no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friend ye are my friend if ye do whatsoever i command you henceforth i call you not servants for the servants knows not what his lord doeth but i call but i have called you friends for all things i have heard of my father i have made known unto you that's in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 13 to 15. And surely a man needs no more to make him happy than to have God his friend. But this is through our Lord Jesus Christ. We must remember that. We are being reconciled and we are being in the peace with God through Christ. So if you, you can't recognize Christ, you can't be at peace with God. So we have to really, really get this knowledge in, embedded, instilled in us and believe that. Because when that time comes, the truth will be, be revealed and every knee shall bow and tongue shall confess that Christ is Lord of Lord and King of King. So we must understand that this is why we have the scripture so we can study and learn who our God is and who Christ is so we can put on Christ. Because that's where the garment is, in Christ. So we must, we must understand that. Now, through Christ as the great peacemaker, the mediator between God and man, that blessed days man that has laid his hands upon us both. Adam, in innocency, had peace with God immediately. There needed no such mediator. But to guilty, sinful man, it is a very dreadful thing to think of God out of Christ, for Christ is our peace. So in other words, it is a very dreadful thing to think God is not in Christ, for Christ is our peace. This is how we get peace. This is how we get salvation. This is how we live eternally. This is where the hope lies, in Christ. He saved us. God made that possible for us to be saved because he so loved the world as john three sixteen reads god so loved the world he sent his only begotten sons that whoever believe shall have eternal life so we must understand his only begotten son that came down from heaven to save us from sin from the death of sin because we couldn't make it on our own we couldn't do it Now we're going to go in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 14. 
For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So in other words, in the Old Testament, we had a wall, a partition, which was the priesthood. Man and the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood was the wall that we had to go through. So now Christ came and abolished that. We're no under that petition. We don't have that petition wall that's between us and God. We can go straight to the Father through Christ, through his spirit. This is how it works now. Everything is spiritual. It's no works of man, hands that we deal with or any camp leader or any any man that's out here or, or scholar or professor that's going to lead you to the Heavenly Father. We have to come boldly ourselves to the throne of glory. Now that was reading. We're going to read that Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 14 once again. For he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That's in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Not only the maker, but the matter and maintainer of our peace. So Christ is the maintainer of our peace for eternity. He is for now and forever and until Christ is our maintainer. He will keep the maintenance up in our peace with the Heavenly Father. Because that's the promise. We're going to go in the book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So Christ is calling shots here on earth and up in heaven. He is the ruler. He's the one that tells all the angels, all the legions what to do. He gives order. They listen to him. God gave him that authority. The heavenly father gave God, Christ that authority to be ruler over. He's at the right hand of the father. So this is how that's working. This is the honor that you have to give Christ. I have to keep this keep this going because I hear a lot of people, they really don't get it. They don't understand how powerful Christ is. They don't understand his authority. His th authority is your inheritance. His authority is your salvation. His authority is your is is your is your eternal life. You should want that. And just being obedient and receiving Christ in your life. That's that shouldn't take that shouldn't take much. Everyone wants love. God is love. His only begotten son, which is in the bosom, which is on the same page, which is even with the Father, is love as well. So if God sent his only begotten son to save us, we think that Christ ain't love. Christ is love. Just like God is love. So it's it, it shouldn't be no problem receiving Christ, putting on Christ, walking in Christ's footsteps, because he walks as the Father will walk, because he's seen it all. First hand. He didn't get he didn't get it from man. He got it firsthand. He was right there with the Father. So whoever if anybody you want to listen to is Christ. Now we're gonna read Colossians once more, chapter one, verse twenty. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him. I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So, I mean, you have to understand that authority. That's in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 2. Now, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We're going to go in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 2. This is a further privilege, not only peace, but grace. That is this favor. The saints, which are all the believers, are in a happy state. It is a state of grace, God's love, kindness to us, and our conformity to God. He that has God's love and God's likeness is in a state of grace. So in other words, when, when God, in the beginning, he said, let's make man in our image and in our likeness. There are men teaching that when he said in our image that we, that God made us to look like him. That has nothing to do with it. 
His image is the fruit of the spirit, his attributes. That's his image. That's his name. And his likeness is when we walk in that love, the peace, the joy, the kindness, the meekness, the humbleness, being patient, long suffering, temperance. This is the likeness that God likes. He wants you to walk in his image. He conformed you. He made you. He made us to in his image. Let's make man in our image. He made us in his image so we can walk in that image. And he likes us to walk in that image. He didn't make us. Or create us so we can just live and then die and that's it that's a waste of creation he created us to live eternity to live in his presence in his kingdom with all the riches of his knowledge and wisdom this is why we was created we wasn't created just to live here and work all our lives and then just go in the grave and that's that that don't make sense he created us to live eternally with him. But now that as we fell in disobedience, we have to be chastised. So in our chastisement, we have to walk in obedience. Now while we're walking in obedience, we're walking in Christ. Where now we're being obedient to the Father. We have peace with him. So this is what this whole thing is all about. So when you miss it, that's why you get angry. And that's why you be discouraged. That's why you get stressed out. That's why all this stuff comes about because you're not following the protocol. It's all about the love of the Heavenly Father through Christ. Now, in, in, into this grace, we have access, which implies that we were not born in this state. We are by nature children of wrath. And the carnal mind is enmity against God but we are brought into it. We could not have got into it ourselves, nor have conquered the difficulties in the way. But we have a man, man reduction, a leading by the hand, are led into it as blind or lame or weak people are led. Are introduced as pardoning offenders. Are introduced by some favorite at court to kiss the king's hand as strangers that are to have audience or conducted we have had access Paul speaks of these of those that have been already brought out of the state of nature into the state of grace Paul in his conversation had this access then he was made nigh Barnabas introduced Paul to the apostles we're going to go in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas had declared that Paul was speaking in the place where he was was he where he was ruling and he came out of that and started speaking in the name of Jesus the gospel so he declared that so he came there and he, he was not ashamed of preaching the word because they they didn't they thought him as Saul so when he had changed God has changed him into Paul he started he learned the gospel now he understood that he received that and now he's preaching the word anywhere he goes He's not being ashamed or not going over there because I used to I used to be a ruler over there. I don't want them thinking. No, he didn't think none of that. He went in Damac Damascus and spoke in the name boldly and preached the word of God, the gospel. That's in the book of Acts, chapter nine, verse twenty seven. And there were others that led Paul by the hand to Damascus. We're gonna go in the book of Romans, chapter five, verse eight. But God commanded his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us so in other words what the, what the scripture is reading right here is telling you that God commanded his love towards us so he commanded so he was making it I'm not even going to stop until these people understand my love for them that's why he sent his only begotten son to die for our sins because he had he wanted to reconcile this hostility that we had between him 
So we wanted he wanted us to come to the like, like I said, his creation would have been non void if we had just live and die. And that's that. His creation is when you get when you create something on the earth, you want that thing to stay forever. Like you want it like, I don't want it to you don't want it to just you get it and a month later it breaks down on you. No. You want to keep that forever. The same thing that God did with his creation. His best creation is man. So he wants you to live forever. Eternally in his presence. He wants to see his work. He don't want to see you dead. God is not the author. He's not the, the God of the dead. And the dead being walking spiritually dead. That don't recognize Christ. So he don't want that. So now when the time comes. He's long suffering with the people that even the non-believers. That's why he's still walking and breathing under the grace of God. But he still wants you to come to him. Come to Christ. This is the whole doctrine of the gospel. Our inheritance. The heaven is at hand. Judgment is at hand. So we have to take choice of what we want to do. In this walk of life. Now. But it was Christ that introduced and led Paul by the hand into this grace. By whom we have access by faith, by Christ as the author and principal agent, by faith as the means of this access, not by Christ in consideration or of any merits or desert of ours, but in consideration of our believing dependence upon Christ and resignation of ourselves to Christ. There are happy standings in this state where we stand not only where we are but where we stand a posture that denotes our discharge from guilt we stand in the judgment we're going to go in the book of psalms chapter 1 verse 5 therefore the, ungo the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous there's not going to be none of that foolishness that's going on right here where it's mixed in. You can do whatever you want to do, say whatever you want to say, believe who you want to believe in. No, it's not going to be that in God's congregation. It's going to be everybody on the same page. Everybody's going to be speaking of the gospel because the gospel is eternal knowledge. It's not going to die away. It don't die. That's a spiritual knowledge is the most spiritual and most powerful doctrine that's in the Bible, the gospel, which is the new covenant, which is the new testament, which people try to they run away from. Stay with the gospel. Stay with Christ. So this way you can be saved because there's no other salvation but through Christ. Now, that's in the book of Psalms, chapter one, verse five. We will read it again. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. We're not going to be mixed in together no more. That's over with once Christ comes. That's in the book of Psalms, chapter 1, verse 5. Now, not cast as convicted criminals, but our dignity and honor secured, not thrown to the ground as objects. The phrase denotes also our progress. While we stand, we are going. We must not lie down as if we had already attained it but but stand as those that are pressing forward stand as servants attending on Christ our master the phrase denotes further our perseverance we stand firmly and safely upheld by the power of God stand as soldiers stand that keeps their ground not borne down by the power of the enemy, it denotes not only our admission to, but our confirmation in. So we'll be confirmed in this power in the gospel. The favor of God is, it is not to, not in the court of heaven as the heavenly courts, where high places are slippery places, but we stand in a humble confidence of this very thing that he who has begun the good work will perform it we're going to go in the book of philippians chapter 1 verse 6 being confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until a day of jesus christ 
That's in the book of Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Now we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Besides the happiness in hand, there is a happiness in hope. The glory of God, the glory which God will put upon the saints in heaven. Glory which will consist in the vision and fruition of God. Those and those only that have access by faith into the grace of God now may hope for the glory of God hereafter. There is no good hope of glory but what is founded in grace. Grace is glory begun. The earnest and assurance of glory, he will give grace and glory. We're going to go to the book of Psalms, chapter 8, verse 11. 80, I'm sorry. Book of Psalms, chapter 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So in other words, God will withhold nothing good from you if you're walking uprightly. That's in the book of Psalms, chapter 84, verse 11. Those who hope for the glory of God hereafter have enough to rejoice in now. Say that again. Those who hope for the glory of God hereafter have enough to rejoice in now. So in our walk of life in this, this world here, we have enough to rejoice in now because we hope for the glory of God hereafter. We're looking for the heavenly. We're looking for the eternally. We're not worried about what's going on right here. So we can walk in the wilderness and be good and, and be rejoiceful in it. It is the duty of those that hope for heaven to rejoice in that hope. Now, we glory in tribulations. When we go through tribulation, we glory in it because we know we have the hope. We're not worrying about the tribulation because it will subside. Whether it be good or bad in this walk of life where we see it, we know we have the hope and we believe in the Heavenly Father through Christ. We have the hope. This is what it's all about. So we glory in the tribulations also, not only notwithstanding our tribulation, these do not hinder our rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. So it's not going to stop us from glorifying God in our hope if we're going through tribulations this is what the teaching is of today we got to understand that because this is keep us at peace but even in our tribulations as they are working for us the weight of glory so in other words we go through tribulation a lot of people we go to everybody on earth goes through some type of trial and tribulation but when it comes down to being obedient nobody wants to be obedient so we say well wait a minute if you don't want the trial of tribulation, walk in obedience. And you'll understand the trial of tribulation that's going to come about because it's written what you're going to go through once you put on Christ and you understand the gospel. Once you in the gospel and you put on Christ and you're walking in Christ and Christ walking in you, you're going to have the tribulation. But you understand this walk is just a shadow. We just walking and we got the we got the, the, the big day to come when Christ returns salvation eternal life so the tribulation here is nothing because we're not going to face that tribulation no more we're going to go in the book of second corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 for our light afflictions which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory that's in the book of second corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 so another person in other words we should not fear if we have hope in christ in our heavenly, in the love of God, we should not fear when we go to trial and tribulations. Take it with patience. Be patient with it. You don't have to complain. You don't have to murmur and quarrel about it. Take it with patience because it's only for a moment. It may seem like a long time to you, but it's only for a moment. And with good faith and hope, this pulls us through. This is what it's all about. What a growing, increasing happiness the happiness of the saints is. Not only so, one would think such peace, such grace, such glory, and such a hope, of, such a hope and joy for it. Where more than such poor, undeserving creatures as we are could pretend to, and yet it is not only so, there are more instances 
of our happiness, we glory in tribulations also, especially tribulations for righteousness sake, which seems the greatest objection against the saints happiness, whereas really their happiness do not only consist with, but takes rise from those tribulations. They rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer. So it's like it's being real humble. It's back, back to being humble. The book of Acts. We're going to go into the book of Acts chapter 5 verse 41. And they departed from the presence of the council. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That's in the book of Acts chapter 5 verse 41. This being the hardest point. He sets himself to show the grounds and reason of, of it. How come? we to glory in tribulation why because tribulations by a chain of, of causes greatly befriends hope which he shows in the method of its influence tribulation the works work of patience not in and of itself but the powerful grace of god working in and with the tribulation so in other words part of god's spirit is patience that's why he's long suffering is being humble, loving, kind. That's his spirit right there. So you you be a patient in your tribulation for God's sake, for Christ's sake. You in the grace of God right there. It proves and by proving and proves patience as part and gifts increase by exercise. It is not the efficient cause, but yields the occasion as still is hardened by the fire. Now, God brings meat out of the eater and sweetness out of the strong. That which worketh patience is matter of joy, for patience does us more good than tribulations can do us hurt. Tribulation in itself worketh impatient, but as it is sanctified to the saints, it worketh patience. Patience experience. We're going to go in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 4. And patience, experience, and patience, and experience hope. Read that again. Romans chapter 5 verse 4. And patience, experience, and experience hope. That's in the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 4. It worketh an experience of God. And the song, and the songs he gives in the night, the patient sufferers has the greatest experience of the divine consolations which abounds as afflictions abounds. It works in the experience of ourselves. It is by tribulation that we make an experiment of our own sincerity. And therefore, such tribulations are called trials. It works as he is approved that has passed the test. Now, Job's tribulation wrought patient, and that patient produced an approbation that still he holds fast his integrity now we're going to go in the book of Job to get that illustration chapter chapter 2 verse 3 and the Lord said unto Satan has thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth a perfect and an upright man one that feareth God and escheweth evil and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou moveth me against him to destroy him without cause. That's in the book of Job, chapter two, verse three. Job was faithful. He didn't. He didn't let the tribulation get the best of him. He kept his integrity, and this is why Job is is favored in the book in the Old Testament. One of the favorites. Now experience hope. He who being tried comes forth as gold. Will there thereby be encouraged to hope is experiment or approbation is not so much the ground as the evidence of our hope and a special friend to it experience of god is a prompt to our hope he that has delivered do and will experience of hopes i'm sorry experience of ourselves helps the evi to evidence our sincerity this hope makes not a shame that is it is a hope that will not deceive us 
nothing confound more than disappointment. Everlasting shame and confusion will be caused by the perishing of the expectation of the wicked. But the hope of the righteous shall be gladness. We're going to go in the book of Proverbs, chapter 10, verse 28. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. That's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 10, verse 28. Now we're going to go in the book of Psalms, chapter 22, verse 5. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. That's in the book of Psalms, chapter 22, verse 5. Now we're going to go in the book of Psalms, chapter 71, verse 1. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. That's in the book of Psalms, chapter 71, verse 1. Or it maketh not ashamed of our suffering, though we are counted as the as the offering of our of all things and trodden underfoot as the mirror in the streets yet having hopes of glory we are not ashamed of these sufferings it is a good cause for a good master and a good hope and therefore we are not ashamed we will never think ourselves disparages by suffering that are likely to end so well because the love of God is shed aboard. This hope will not disappoint us because it is sealed with the Holy Spirit as a spirit of love. It is the gracious work of the blessed spirit to shed aboard the love of God in the hearts of all the saints. Now the love of God, that is the sense of God's love to us drawing out love in us to God again or the great effects of God's love special grace and pleasant gust or sense of it it is shed aboard as sweet anointment perfuming the soul as rain watering it and making it fruitful the grounds of all our comfort and holiness and perseverance in both is laid in the shedding aboard of the love of God in our hearts it is this which constrains us we're going to go in the book of 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 and 15 for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that is one died for all then we're all dead we're going to start that again 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 and 15 for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that is one die for all then we're all dead and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again that's in the book of second corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 and 15 now we draw now we draw and held by the bonds of love. Sense of God's love to us will make us not ashamed either of our hope in Christ or our suffering for Christ's sake. In Christ Jesus' name, may God be the glory as I walk, live, and pray in your image and likeness, the fruit of the Spirit. I come in love and leave in peace, grace and peace and much love and blessings to you and your family. Have a blessed day to all the saints, my brothers and sisters. Amen.